Hi, uh, thanks very much for joining. I'm Charles Kenny, uh, the Senior Fellow and, and Director of Technology and Development at CGD. Delighted to have you here and uh, delighted too to have uh, Catherine and Michael here. Uh, Catherine is still for a little while longer the Chief Executive Officer of the Wikimedia Foundation, uh, which supports the wonder that is Wikipedia, as well as Wikimedia Commons, Wikidata, Wikisource, Wiktionary, um, and a range of uh, other fantastic projects. She's helped sort of dramatically expand the organization, not just financially, but also bringing in more yeah. and particularly more underrepresented voices to the Wikimedia project. Um, she's long worked uh, at the intersection of technology and human rights and democracy uh, and international development. Um, and also you know, worked on, on both coasts. Uh, we met uh, a while ago in DC and has, uh, done some and has done some incredibly interesting work in the past and continues to think a lot about uh, the sort of intersection of human rights and technology and foreign policy. Um, it's great that you'll be talking to, to Michael, our CGD zone, uh, who's here working on the global governance of data in, in particular and how we make sure that the interests of all are represented at the table when decisions that have global impact uh, around data governance are taken. Uh, with the sadly recently departed Benno and Dulu and Pam Dixon, he recently wrote a piece on how countries are struggling to translate de facto global standards on data privacy and protection into local contexts. Given that, I'm hugely looking forward to the discussion between the two of them and won't waste any more of your time by talking myself. So Michael, over to you. Thanks, Charles. Thanks very much. And I will echo you in saying how excited and grateful we are to speak with Catherine today. Um, Catherine, your background and the success you've had at Wikimedia and your, your earlier career uh, in ICT policy world really puts you in a unique position to kind of weigh in on the challenges we face in making the internet work better for everyone. Um, so thank you for taking the time. And I should mention to our viewers, uh, we'll be taking questions for Catherine, uh, turning to them at, at the end of the program. And um, you can submit them three ways. You can send us an email at events at cgddev.org. Uh, you can tweet them with the hashtag CGDDev or CGDTalks, uh, or you can submit your comments uh, via YouTube. And, and we'll, we'll pull those in towards the end of the conversation. Um, but Catherine, I just wanna start at a very high level. Um, obviously much of the debate today uh, around digital technology and platforms focuses on some version of how do we get the good without the bad. Um, but I want to focus on the good first, because the common thread in your career has been promoting access to information. Uh, I want to know from you why that is an important cause, and, and when did you decide to kind of dedicate your professional life to promoting it? Was it a single instance, or did you fall into it? Or, but First, I just want to know why it's such an important cause for you. Yeah, I, it, it was not a single instance, and, and I sort of make sense of it only in retrospect. Um, I started really working in the development space when I was at UNICEF and much of the focus at that time was around access to services. And I moved into sort of the democracy and governance space and, and that was really around how do we make this access to services question a participatory one. And as I was involved in that work, it became really a conversation around, okay, well, what are the rights and responsibilities around these new technologies. It's one thing to say, we've got access to services, how do we now make it participatory, but how do we also safeguard the rights of those people who are using those services and think about that as sort of a broader structural question around technology regulation and policy. And that really led me to Wikimedia, which is kind of a, a amalgamation of all of these different things. It's very much around access to information as sort of filling a critical need. Um, it is around this idea of local control and decentralization that's appropriate to the communities that need that information. Um, and I think as well, really representing a version of the web that is a citizen centric or a, I really hate the term user. So like citizen centric or, or person centric approach, uh, which is a free and open web that is responsive to the needs of people built by the needs of people and governed by, by the folks who use it. And so the piece of our access to information to me, you could sort of like refer back to Maslow's hierarchy. I started at UNICEF really looking at like education and health and, and access to those services. And now here I am at information. And I really see it all on a continuum, um, which is when people have access to what they need 
need, it enables us to thrive and it enables human flourishing really broadly. In the case of Wikipedia, it's for us, the, uh, the animating factor is if you have access to the information you need, we are able to have better informed, be better informed as individuals, live in communities that are better informed and, and really have what we know, what we need in order to think about how we want to be governed in the societies we want to live in. Great. And so since we're starting off with the kind of the, the bargain, the good and the bad, let's let's talk about the bad first and then and talk about what Wikipedia is, sorry, Wikimedia has done to, to uh, nurture the good. Um, yeah. You use the term epistemic emergency. It's clearer than ever that, you know, the same channels that promote access to credible information can be easily manipulated uh, to spread disinformation. When you use the term epistemic emergency, uh, what do you mean by that? It, it's a little bit of everything and it's not just about technology. I don't want to sort of blame social platforms or messaging apps for the issues that we're in today. What we're really seeing is a combination of yes, a networked reach and dissemination function that social platforms enable that did not previously exist at scale and all sorts of questions about, well, how do we govern that? How do we regulate that? What are the norms that we want in our societies? What are the norms globally? Because they may be different from community to community, country to country, you Know, continent to continent. Um, and then also looking at sort of this collapse of institutional trust, which really to me is about sort of responsive institutions, responsive to public needs. There's a, a, a bigger question at work. When I talk about institutions, it's not sort of like the institution, for example, of, of CGD. It's really these conceptual institutions, the institution of a free press, the institution of the judiciary, the institution of public education. We're seeing a move within society away from confidence in these institutions, being able to be responsive to public needs, being able to be responsive to a changing world, being able to be responsive to these increased sort of volatility and pressure, um, whether economic, climate, or otherwise. And, and that, I think, has really undermined what public trust is in these institutions and therefore makes conversations around, well, can I trust the information coming out of these institutions? Is this a stable baseline for coming to consensus and decision-making much more difficult? That the trends in trust that we're seeing today are far more in the direction of insti uh, from institutional to individual trust. And that raises, that coincides very nicely with sort of the rise of these large technology platforms and the, the ideas of influencers and the like. And so, Yes, it's an issue of the reach and access and, and network infrastructure, um, network modalities of tech, but it is also very much a question of like, how does governance evolve in this day and age in order to be receptive and responsive to the needs of, of citizens globally? And so that coincidence you're talking about. Yeah, maybe it's coincidence, maybe it's causal. <laughs> I want to get yeah. the the one to put together. I mean, do you have thoughts on and whether it is causal or is it coincidental? Uh, no, I mean, I, I don't think it's coincidental. I think that it is certainly the case that as we have become more, I keep using this term network, more networked as societies, uh, we have an expectation for more responsiveness, more transparency, more ex even more certainty in information. But the, but the corollary to that is as we become more networked, the certitude that we have, the opportunity to process and come to determinations around decision-making has that that time frame, those time frames have telescoped into, into such short periods of time. So we're having now a dynamic in which the general public it has access to you know, infinite information from infinite sources. And yet the sources that we look to for sort of credible information are more and more on the line in a way that makes it harder for them to be able to go through the processes of determining credibility, determining you know, degrees of confidence or confidence yeah. intervals uh, to be able to provide that information information. And, and that is a network effect, absolutely. Whether that is tech platforms or just sort of the nature of an inter-networked society, uh, I, I, I think we'd have, regardless of who the current tech platforms are today, we'd have other ones if it weren't them. And so I don't want to sort of blame sort of big tech for this. This is the nature of the society that we've merged into. Um, I do also think that what we're seeing, the rise of this inter-network opportunity has created a space for a challenging of mainstream narrative and mainstream power. And so some of the lack of confidence that we're seeing has always existed in societies and marginal at the margins, marginalized communities. Um, 
who have had long and, and often very good reasons for distrust of these institutions, but are for some of the first times being able to vocalize that in ways that is more present within the public discourse. And so we're seeing a little bit of fraying around the edges as we move from sort of monolithic narratives of trust, power, and um, public discourse into these more uh, fra fragmented conversations that we're having today. That, that's, yeah, that's a great, excellent, and pretty clear framing. I think of the the existential problem we have in the information ecosystem. And, I, and I'm gonna go back there and talk about potential solutions. How do we nurture healthier discourse in that ecosystem? But I think a lot of the answers we might touch on are gonna be found in how Wikimedia has evolved. So I do wanna take a step back and talk about Wikimedia. So sure. in January, you celebrated the 20th uh, birthday of the organization. You've been with Wikimedia since uh, 2014, I think. Um, how has the organization evolved and how has its role in the information ecosystem evolved over both those periods? This is this is where it gets fun, right? So everyone kind of knows the origin story of Wikipedia. It's an encyclopedia that everyone can edit and you clearly can't trust it, right? Um, and this is a big part of where Wikipedia came from was it was an experiment on the web at a time when the web was very different 20 years ago. You, you know, we're still sort of coming out of the time of web rings. The wiki, which is a technology that is used, hence the name Wikipedia, was the first time you were really able to publish very quickly to the web without knowing sort of like HTML and CSS and, and code. Um, the it enabled people to sort of experiment in this fun space around information aggregation, but it also raised all these questions about like, well, who could trust it? It's not an expert. And, you know, we're sitting here with a with a group of experts in the Center for Global Development. Um, and yet over the course of 20 years, Wikipedia has truly evolved to play a very different role than it did in that. It, and I think even than it aspired to 20 years ago. So in the first decade, it was all about how do we really set the policies that enable Wikipedia to be successful? So policies around notability, policies around reliability, policies around the requirement for citations back to reputable sources, policies against original research in order to be able to have sort of a layer of secondary source credibility. Um, most of these are not new policies. They draw on things like the scientific method. They draw on things like the practice of journalism and source checking, um, peer review and the like, but applied in this new domain created the opportunity for Wikipedia to really expand uh, exponentially. And so as Wikipedia brought together people who focus on very different areas of information aggregation, you had these subsets of communities that co-mingled generalists and experts in their different domains, ranging from like the train spotting folks to the folks who are very deeply involved in sort of current events and politics to people who really look at some of the like historical um, records and where we come from. Mm -hmm. Today, Wikipedia plays a role that is, of course, that encyclopedia. I bet most people in the audience have checked Wikipedia in the past week, whether phone or your, your computer. And, and that's a really fundamental role for us. It is a, um, we have 55 million articles across 300 different languages. We have received a billion and a half devices visiting our sites every single month. We're one of the top most popular, top 10 most popular websites on the planet. Uh, the, the thing that is remarkable to me is not just that we're that, it is that we have really emerged as one of the only trusted sort of universal not universal, but let's say 80 to 70% of the population trusted sources in certainly English, um, but in many other languages as well, with a sort of central credibility that I think raises interesting questions about trust and the composition of knowledge and how that, that all works. But we've also become a resource for many other sort of under the hood aspects of the web. So uh, computational science research, natural language processing, all of these sorts of ways in which the how we think about the formation of knowledge, the bodies of knowledge, the ways that we use language, um, Wikipedia plays a really central role in exploring that today in sort of the social sciences um, and, uh, and computational sciences. And so we, I like to think of us as this remarkable sprawling experiment that has actually turned into a really interesting record of humanity and the ways in which we seek information and the ways in which we grapple with information in real time as we compose what, what, what is knowledge. Great. I, yeah. And you didn't mention my favorite wiki, I think, which is wiki species which yeah. is a, to, to waste time and, and see all the things living on this planet. It's really fascinating. Um, 
So I want to go back to an op-ed you wrote in for the New York Times in 2019, um, and you raised um, the, the kind of the theme was this emphasis on the importance of keeping humans rather than AI front and center when we're thinking about the design and reform of the internet. Mm. And I'm going to use that to touch on a few themes you raised. Um, one of the points you made was, you know, we ought to aim to get back to some of the original ideals that or principles that underpinned uh, the internet in the early days, like creation, collaboration, um, connection. But at the same time, we also need to recognize that in the early days of the internet, it was also very expensive and exclusionary. Yeah. So, and I know Wikipedia is very invested in this idea of knowledge equity. Mm -hmm. I wanna hear you talk about that and understand exactly what you mean. And then also hear from you um, what actions the organization has taken to advance inclusivity among its users particularly among groups that have you know, historically had less access to the internet. Um, in many countries, that's women. Um, it's often people living in poor communities. So how do you make sure members of these groups aren't just consumers of knowledge, but are also producing it? Yeah, and I, I love that you ended there on consumers versus producers. A big piece of what we care about is the right to participate in knowledge. So it is not about production on behalf of consumers. It is really this idea that when you, even when you read a Wikipedia article, you're active, you are actively saying that knowledge matters. You are an active participant in the construction of knowledge, the value of knowledge, and the ways in which we think about what society um, is spending its time and attention on at any point in time. So, and then the next step in is to edit a Wikipedia article to participate in that construction of knowledge. And you know, one of my favorite stats on this is Wikipedia is edited 350 times a minute, which is basically 350 times a minute that you have the opportunity to challenge what is known in order to rewrite history or to rewrite public you know, narratives around power, control, representation, and the like. And so there's some really fun sort of questions in that. Um, you, you said something that I like about getting back to the early parts of the internet. I, I, I'm not nostalgic about the early parts of the internet. I actually, as you rightly noted, think it was highly exclusionary, expensive, and, and largely dominated by white men. Um, the Instead, it's really about thinking about the initial, initial intention and opportunity of an internet offered, which is a space for creativity. And one of the things that we've seen is we have really moved towards a consumer-oriented web. And, and that's fine. You know, commercial spaces are very important um, to you know our economy and to the ways in which uh, people have access to services. But we also want to create space for people to be engaged in this sort of participatory dynamic and to have active say in the ways in which those spaces are constructed, which is our way of thinking about questions of like ethical AI, consent to governance, all of the, all of the sort of questions that you know you started by speaking about. You know your role in terms of thinking about governance of data, for example. Um, the way that we're approaching this currently, I think in the most public facing way is this question of knowledge equity. So if you look at Wikipedia, 55 million articles, English Wikipedia, 6 million articles, you think, okay, like that's everything that I need in the world, right? Like I can explore Wikipedia infinitely and I can find everything I want. Uh, that is simply not true. So only 2% of the articles on Wikipedia um, that have a geotag location refer to the continent of Africa. The continent of Africa is one of the largest sort of landmass continents. You can imagine compared to the, con the subcontinent of Europe, I don't know how we call that these days, the, the landmass of Europe, um, the political entity of Europe, incredibly dense representation of geotagged content. So we clearly have a discrepancy here, a bias in terms of the comp composition of knowledge on Wikipedia. 18% of biographies are about women not representative of the overall global balance of women in the world, certainly not representative of women's participation in societies today, their influence, their notability. Knowledge equity is not just about how do we rewrite this balance on Wikipedia, it's really looking at how do we interrogate the systems, the power and the privilege that have either intentionally excluded individuals from participating in narratives around power, culture, history, knowledge and the like, or are systemic issues such as lack of access to the internet, lack of access to the electricity, lack of access to leisure time that exclude people, whether intentionally or not. So you've got questions of like colonialism, minority and majority language, languages that need to be grappled with um, in sort of the Wikipedia context. What are the sources that we're looking at? What are the ways in which those sources are exclusionary intentionally? What are the ways in which when we even write, I'm going to come back to this issue example of, of content about Africa, what are the ways in which those have been written by um, through settler narratives or through 
uh, individuals coming from outside of uh, African countries to tell those stories on behalf of African communities. And then also these questions of what can we do to uplift and redress and invest in the equity so that can those communities have access to the tools that they need to start participating meaningfully. And then that raises this whole other question, and this is the last thing I'll let you get to your next question, <laughs> is really around even the construction of Wikipedia itself, how, how much of that is, you know, we started as this radical idea of free and open information. How much should we just recapitulate the canon? How much should we say, all right, well, it has to come from a reliable source. It has to be published and it has to be written and it has to go through peer review all of which is great perhaps in some ways for establishing credibility. It means that our scientific articles, our mathematical articles, really high quality. But what about things like oral tradition? What about things that have um, not, sort, not been viewed as paradigmatically important through that lens of sort of Western knowledge construction? How do we really think about decolonizing the space of Wikipedia so that it is a more inclusive representation of knowledge so that it does serve our mission of you know, every single human, all the world's knowledge, uh, which we're very far from today. And so let me, flip, let me just ask you the question you just asked, how do you do it and how do you support particularly this question of how you su support and nurture new users. Um, as you said, most of the editors historically of Wikipedia have been white males, but how do you promote um, other communities coming in and taking an active role in the production of knowledge on Wikipedia? So this is really tough. <laughs> I'm not going to pretend it's not. Um, we're in the midst of uh, International Women's uh, International Women's Day was earlier this month. It's Women's History Month in the United States. Last month was Black History Month in the United States. Um, we you know, certainly used and take advantage of these opportunities and put placing underrepresented groups far to the forefront of the conversation. We have a project right now called Project Rewrite, which is really about taking, not just asking the question of how do we do this on Wikipedia, but engaging other institutions that are knowledge producing institutions. So certainly think tanks, research institutions, academic institutions, institutions of journalism. Um, there was an LSE study that found that men are five, are five out of six people likely to be quoted in an article are, are going to be men as ex, sort of expert representation. So how do we really think about getting deeper into, um, into the funnel around the construction and re representation of knowledge? But on Wikipedia, we've done a few things. One of which is, uh, First of all, we've been very explicit. This is of value to us. So 42% of the world's population by the year 2100 is going to be African. We have a lot of work to do if we're going to be able to meet the needs of African knowledge users. Um, you know, it doesn't matter, large percentage of the African population speaks English. If all that English language content is about dead British men, it's just not that interesting to most people. And so what does it mean to actually meet sort of the demand, the supply that's relevant? And so recognizing this and calling this out and then investing in the nascent communities that have been developing across the African continent, we went from having, I think, four different countries represented in sort of our global user community uh, to now more than around 25. So it's about 500% growth over the course of the last five years by simply being explicit about the fact that this is necessary and then providing functional resources to grow these communities. So we do have about, about eight to $10 million in grant making a year, setting aside funding that is very explicitly for emerging communities, funding the ability for people to develop capacity, to convene, to create a sense of community is one really important thing. It's literally just saying, we see you, we know you're here, let's make sure you have the resources you need to build the communities you want. That's, that's one piece of it. Another piece of it is really around looking at the institutional structural issues on Wikipedia itself. And I sort of break those down in, in a few different ways. One of which is when I started, we didn't have mobile editing. Now, mobile editing is essential to the production of knowledge, not just for people in you know, emerging markets, but for any new young person on the planet. Most people now experience the web through the lens of mobile as opposed to the lens of desktop. So building out a mobile editing software, that was a really huge piece of it. Building for OS's operating systems that are specific and endemic to the regions that we wanted to be in. So not just like sort of the iPhone and Android, but also there's something called KaiOS, which is very popular in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, building for these tools, Latin America as well. Um, then looking at the uh, questions of the 
welcoming this of our software itself. So once you start to edit Wikipedia, what are the ways in which you sort of flow through the process to learn the policies so that one of the things that doesn't happen is you don't bounce out because you know you use a reference that might be completely acceptable in the place in which uh, you come from because it might be a media source, but it may not sort of meet the standards at the, at the international level. And so sort of what are these questions of how do we give people the information they need to be successful from the get-go? And then the last piece of it is really um, around creating culture that is welcoming so that when new people join Wikipedia, we're in a dialogue with them from the get-go around the fact that they are valued and also looking at engaging our existing community to say, you know, people, as we expand this movement, as we, you know, people may do things slightly differently. They may come in with different appreciations. They may come in with different editing patterns because they have access to, in, to internet time or electricity in a different way. Um, they may view some things as notable that you wouldn't necessarily view as notable. Let's have those conversations in a productive way. Let's think about productive friction, but let's not get into um, sort of ad hominem attacks or conversations that, that sort of push out new contributors, which is a, a pattern that we've seen. So we introduce a universal code of conduct, which is really about enabling us to raise the floor so that everyone is welcome. So it's about looking at cleaning up our own house in terms of the culture of inclusion and the culture of welcoming. It's about building software tools that are responsive to the needs of the communities that we seek to serve and, and you know, moving beyond the tools that are familiar to us. So hiring teams, um, and giving them autonomy and in, in teams out of Nairobi, teams out of Bangalore who are really building for the communities that they're in. And it's about broad, broadly engaging with the with the ecosystem of knowledge to say, you know, let's really interrogate the sources and and um, the sources that are available to us to, to really think about how we reconstruct this conversation. And then, oh, sorry, and then there's a whole question of policy, you know, censorship and access and privacy and surveillance um, in the broader internet regulatory space. So that's, but that's a, that's a global issue for, for sure. Yeah, and, and I'll try to swing back to that. The one thing you didn't mention that I thought you might would be the kind of the local language initiatives. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Sorry, that's, yeah. that's so institutionalized for us. I don't even think about it. Yeah, we actually support about 300 plus languages on Wikipedia today, which fun fact is about 100 more than even a platform like Google currently serves. So our investment in our right to left language team, for example, is, is one of the larger parts of, of what we do. We've invested very heavily in tools that enable people to talk and translate between languages um, so that you can you can take one Wikipedia and, and use it as a baseline for translating into another Wikipedia. Um, the we have a number of initiatives that we've been doing with with Google actually as a partner around looking at well what are the um, the search needs in languages that are underrepresented. So very interestingly in South Asia we have the a, a plethora of Indic languages. I think about. 23 Indic languages currently, um, ranging from very small to very large, but Hindi is actually one of the most underrepresented languages. And the reasons for that are sort of fascinating, but also evident, you know, many people who are Hindi speakers are also English speakers. They prefer to edit in English. If you're like an Odia speaker or a Malayalam speaker, you actually tend to prefer to edit in those languages. And so working with Google to say, well, what are the search terms in Hindi that are going underrepresented and how do we sort of feed that back into our community so they can say, oh, this might be like a language or a knowledge gap that we can fill. Um, so it's, it's a software engineering question. It's really ensuring that people have the tools I and mean, editing in, um, um, in right to left languages is very difficult. The construction of software um, usability in those languages is very difficult. And then really thinking about how do we elevate that uh, not just from a stock software perspective, but also like programmatically in terms of support. Um, you know, we ran an, an event recently for our West African community, and we made sure that we had translators into uh, Hausa and Igbo and other uh, languages that would otherwise not necessarily sort of be like in this UN language category to really thinking about accessibility for non-native speakers. So I want to go back to the, the New York Times op-ed I mentioned to the, the kind of your broader theme in that point was again, taking humans out of the internet e equation. And there are two ways, and one you've already kind of referenced is censorship, that's the most explicit way people are taken, their role is taken away from um, participating in the internet. Um, and the second more opaque uh, is through algorithms and the way that algorithms categorize people and that determines what we read, who, who we might engage with, who we might see as a potential dating partner, what goods we're shown to purchase. And, and, and more importantly, you know, well, those are all important, but. Um, what services we might have access to and, and you know, what, whether we can be extended credit or not. Yeah. Um, 
And you kind of, you close with the normative arguments that I think most would agree with that we should ensure that AI supports humans rather than replaces them. Um, what I wanna do is kind of push back beyond the normative argument towards the kind of thinking about possible solutions, right? Um, and solutions that would allow us still to kind of preserve the openness of the internet that I think most people value. In years past, self-regulation was seen, I think, at least in the United States, broadly as the way to do this. Um, that view seems less tenable today. Mm. Um, but let's start there, maybe. Is self-regulation still the best of the set of imperfect solutions, or does government need to play a more active role? So I think that there are ways in which regulation can be very powerful and valuable for the technology sector. We regulate almost every other sector. It's not inconceivable to think that the tech should be regulated. The question is where and how. Um, the I would say that it's very dangerous for us to start getting engaged in conversations of regulating speech. I know that that's probably something that most people in an American audience feel more comfortable with. It is a topic of real discussion in sort of many, uh, certainly in Brussels, but in many countries around the world. Um, there are some, there are sort of the principled values oriented conversations around should we sh or should we not regulate speech, but then there are also some practical ones that I think platforms are often, mm, I think that there are a lot of really smart people working at tech platforms who are pushing back against the regulation of speech in ways that are often perceived as that being self-serving, but as a platform that is a nonprofit with a public interest mandate, let me say that uh, it is not a good idea to regulate speech or ask platforms to regulate speech because there are absolutely incentive structures that would cause platforms to reduce the amount of services that they offer to be more censorious than might otherwise be narrowly accepted within sort of a human rights or freedom of expression framework in order to reduce liability. Um, furthermore, the scale of speech on platforms as a whole today is almost impossible to regulate ba based on sort of human intervention. And so then you get into questions of algorithmic regulation, which causes real challenges for people who have, uh, let's say, particularly sort of minority and um, dissenting views. And so I'm not, I, there's obviously a conversation there about sort of what do you do about questions of extremism and white nationalism and radicalization, but there are also questions around groups that have historically been excluded from dialogue, that have used platforms to be able to speak publicly about sort of the challenges that they face, whether these are gender minorities or, um, you know, uh, racial minorities or political minorities. Uh, so self-regulation in the speech space is something that I am still very passionately an advocate for. Uh, the question of broader regulation, say, on sort of advertising revenue or political advertising, I think that there's a lot of space there to get into conversations. I also think there's a lot of opportunity for within the market space for investors to apply some degree of scrutiny in the same way that we do through like the ESG conversation currently today. I mean, there is a entire history of like the extractive industries coming coming together, not always 100% successfully, but through frameworks that are around transparency and reporting and, and coming in line with sort of institutional investor expectations. I think that there's a really broad opportunity there that we're not having a, enough of a conversation around that goes beyond this question of sort of legislative oversight or regulation. Um, so I hope, I mean, I hope that answers your question. I, I'm I do think the speech one is is really complicated, particularly because oftentimes when we start regulating speech in, in democratic countries, that creates a big leap for the regulation of speech in non-democratic countries in ways that can be not just sort of marginally harmful to individuals, but structurally harmful um, with regards to the preservation of um, dissent and political participation. And so on the, and I, I fully understand that point, you mentioned the role of investors. Um, do you see any evidence that investors are going to be willing to take on that that responsibility, that that broader social view um, of their actions and their investments? Um, I don't know about the next five years. I think that maybe in the next ten years. I think you've you've certainly seen some interesting conversations that have not necessarily been around uh, tech platforms per se, but around the 
pulling of advertiser dollars on, on cable networks, for example, or um, support political funding for individual political candidates. And, and, and that's sort of the elephant in the room, right? We're really often talking about politics here and sort of what are the bounds of political speech. Uh, I do think that if you look back at the history of like, again, ESGs, that was a something that took a long time to come to fruition and is now a very mainstream thing. And that that sort of tilting point was really um, in in maybe like the last 10 to five to 10 years in, in which this became something that is mainstream. It's no longer fringe. It's no longer sort of boutique investment. It's no longer boutique investors. So I think there's opportunity. I, I have yet to see people really um, in the business and human rights space articulate what the case might be. And so I, I I am not somebody who comes from a finance background. I would love to see a greater and deeper exploration of that. I think I think that it would be a, a very fruitful and, and fertile ground. And one one other question on regulation, um, and this is moving beyond regulating speech to, you know, ideas floating around. And and Applebaum and her colleague Peter, I think it's Peter Pomerantsev. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah. This month's Atlantic Monthly talked about you know stop focusing on regulating speech and focus on regulating algorithms instead. Now that, that would require this a is much higher conversation. expertise within yeah. government to be able to do this, but do you think that is a, a direction in which to, that we should consider going down that path and why or why not? I mean, regulating algorithms at the level of government regulators, I think is, is a challenging proposition, not least because of the talent recruitment question. Um, but the, I do think that there are some very big sort of broad principles that, that could be applied from a governance standpoint. And so when we think about ethical AI, which is essentially al algorithms, um, at the Wikimedia Foundation, we think about a couple of things. We think about, you know, how are, what are the data sets that we're training on and how do we ensure that those data sets are not just audited at the point of ingestion, but have the opportunity to be re-audited as training models evolve. And so every algorithm, every, it's not just AI, like machine learning, very basic stuff um, is trained on data. If the data is bad, there's an acronym for this in the tech world, it's GIO, it's GIGO, it's garbage in, garbage out. Um, so on Wikipedia, for example, I, I really like our product, but an article about a woman is four times more likely to mention her marital status than an article about a man. And so that's garbage in, garbage out that associates women with their marital status in a way that then can perpetuate within sort of the application of that when it's productized in the world. And so you might like go to pull up a search and it might be more likely to say, is so-and-so married or what, what have you, or associate women with the institution of marriage or domestic activities because of those um, the ways in which that data set might have been trained. So auditing that data set from the get-go to be able to say like, is this data set good? Does this avoid the stigmatization or the stereotyping of ethnic minorities? Does this avoid some of these gender representation issues? Is this inclusive of a broad enough um, demographic to be able to be broadly representative so that this can be a useful tool for, for a variety of different people? But certainly we see these conversations in the health sector all the time. Is, is really important. So that's the initial auditing. Then closed loop systems, closed loop systems being this idea that once you build the thing, you go back and check to make sure it has the intention that you want. You don't just let it run wild and sort of see what happens and post hoc justify it. So closed loop systems are a process of continuously checking back to ensure that you're having the outcome that's important. I like to think a lot about legibility and consent as a component of this too. So there's this principle in, in, in mature or in, in democracies, which is like, if you can't understand the laws by which you're governed in the broadest possible sense, then you're not truly living in a, in a system that is responsive as a democratic system. Um, and so if you don't have access to that, that like legible body of code, code or law, then, mm -hmm. then you are essentially excluded from being able to navigate and participate meaningfully as a person who is fully in, in, enabled with your rights. All of us who are non-technical and including many software engineers have a harder time accessing the functioning of algorithms. And so what is the principle of legibility that we want to, to see? And it's much more complicated than transparency because I'm not actually talking about code. I'm talking about the intentionality, the application, and the auditing of the application um, as, a, as another important principle today. Uh, and so those are some of the things that I think are, are very um, 
they're doable. Uh, and having some sort of body that then could be an auditing function on top of that for algorithms would seem to me much more, more valuable than say, trying to individually regulate every algorithm that every tech company produces because everything's a tech company today. You know, as you rightly, I mean, you sort of in, into intimate, intimated, you know, everything from bail bonds to access to um, public services to, you know, of course, like the tech platforms that we associate with social media and the like, everything is a tech platform. Yeah, I mean, that those are a great set of technical solutions that if if followed, I, it's, it's understandable to me that the, the level of difference that that could make, I guess the question is, and I'm not putting you on the spot to answer this, but <laughs> out loud is, um, does there need to be, does the incentive need to come with some punishment if that's not followed by tech companies? I mean, yeah, of course. Like that's what fines are for, right? That's what. But that's that, what the, that gets to the question of whether <laughs> have a more active role in what has been kind of the hands-off process to this point. I'm just going to come back and say that every almost every other sector is regulated. You know, aviation is regulated. Our food supply chain is regulated. I, I mentioned extractive industries before; those are regulated. Children's toys are regulated. Like everything is regulated, and there are fines associated with it. Now, they're often nominal. Um, they often have as much to do with bad PR as anything else. But let's, yeah, I have no problem with introducing a little accountability into the systems. I think it is. It's completely appropriate. This is a mature economy. This is a mature sector. It's 20 years old. I think the biggest issue that when we talk about this actually is really around how do we ensure that this is a system that has a sliding scale that enables innovation? So you, before we got on, we were talking about innovation. Regulating purely for the incumbents is only going to reinforce the position of the incumbents because now you're creating regulatory barriers that are so high and so hard that new innovations are going to have a hard time sort of meeting those expectations. And so how do we have a sliding scale that creates space for new innovation, that creates space for different models of production, different models of capitalization, commercial product offerings, so that you can actually have a competitive marketplace, which you know functionally doesn't really exist today in in sort of the tech platform sector, and certainly you know selfishly as Wikipedia, if we had to comply with the same sort of sets and standards and expectations that a larger tech company would have to comply with, we'd have a really hard time. We're a 500 person nonprofit with a fraction of the. I mean, I, I joke our budget's the same as like a cafeteria in Mountain View, you know. So it, it's really creating that space for different models is going to be a sort of fundamental question for any legislators or regulators looking at these issues. Yeah, this I, I like that point a lot because it gets to some of the work I'm doing, which is focused not just on what's well, not focused at all really on what's happening domestically with the United States, but it's thinking through, you know, the glo the standard of or the norms and principles of data governance that are um, kind of being set at a de facto level globally, like, you know, much is building off the EU GDPR. You know, I've been in meetings with uh, representatives of the big tech firms that are very comfortable to now operate under a GDPR-like system, but it does it does impart a competitive advantage for them because they have teams of lawyers that can function under those um, requirements. Whereas small and medium enterprises in poorer countries are going to struggle mightily um, to to work under that same system. So before leaving this kind of the regulatory space discussion. Because you've worked both in DC and in Silicon Valley, I, I want to get your thoughts on. We know that you know the Biden administration just by its hirings. We see Lena Khan, we see Tim Wu headed into the administration. We know they will not be taken as an accommodative stance as the Obama administration did. Mm. And I'm wondering, what is what it, do you have views on how to make the relationship productive and collaborative and better between DC and Silicon Valley and move? And jointly move into a, in a better direction. Well, I think it's it's <laughs> um, the accommodative stance on on behalf of the Obama administration, and and I wasn't in it, so I I have you know no idea what the inside was. I, I think that there were some rational reasons for that. Um, you know, this was a time in which some of these tech companies were were not as established as they are today. There was a, it was an opportunity for the creation and the nurturing of a new sector in the American economy. This was a time in which people were looking at sort of the influence of these tech companies as a form of soft power in terms of foreign policy and diplomacy. We certainly saw that and those narratives reinforced in 2009 in Iran, uh, in 2011 across the Arab Middle East, you know, it, in many sort of other places in the world, whether that was rational or you know a rose tinted glasses, I'm I'm going to err on the side of rose tinted glasses. I, I think it is it is appropriate. Um, 
And then, of course, in the last four years, I think the tech companies really moved into a posture of like, we are the resistance uh, because our California values, you know, hold us up to be the resistance. Well, while, while actually, you know, on the inside, in terms of policy making, particularly in some platforms, being extraordinarily accommodating to the current, you know, the previous administration. And so, really, what we we've seen is is a, in in my opinion, is a form of sort of accommodation and co option between tech the tech industry and the and you know DC. Um, that is far cozier than I think most people sort of see on the outside, even over the course of the last of recent memory. I think it is important as well as from the tech sector, seeing DC as largely ineffectual and, interfe and you know, interfering in the functioning of, um, of growth innovation and you know, global disruption. I think it would be very healthy for Silicon Valley to develop some respect for the notion of citizen-led democratic governance and understand the um, accountabilities to legislators as sort of the ultimate representation of the democratic system. Um, part of that, the reason that they've been able to get away with doing that is sort of this practice of like jurisdictional arbitrage of moving things around. Um, more cooperation, transatlantic and otherwise, among legislators would likely be helpful in reducing some of the power of Silicon Valley to sort of hop, scot, 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 yeah, um, from one place to another when they, when they don't like the threats that are put their way. Um, it is not that you know DC taking a harder line on the tech companies is going to irreparably sour the relationship between tech and um, and DC. It is simply that in policymakers. Play, taking a harder line on these tech companies, I think, in my experience, is actually going to create a um, form of respect that would that would start to move some of the tech sector perhaps a little bit more in line with this understanding of you know policy has sort of an ultimate priority uh, if we want to live in representative democratic systems. So I don't know. I don't know if that's a good answer, but but I would love to see you know any administration take a slightly more robust line. I think it is appropriate. I think it is not going to shake the foundations of tech. Tech will simply evolve and accommodate um, accordingly. And one of the things you mentioned was the, the kind of the fleet footedness of these companies in, in jumping jurisdictions um, to deal with different regulatory issues. Uh, it does strike me that, and we see this at the transatlantic level, but I think we see it more globally, interest in greater cooperation on the regulation of digital platforms broadly. Yeah. Um, let me move this into a question. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> let me shift this into a question. Have you, I mean, is that what you're seeing in your discussion? And I'm most interested, we're the Center for Global Development, so I'm most interested in the countries that have kind of not Sorry. been at the table on these discussions within the, the G7, the OECD, on regulating AI or regulating digital platforms. Are you seeing more uh, keenness by policymakers to engage on these issues and more concern? Um, or no? Or maybe it's not on their radar yet. Um, I don't know that I see that from a sort of domestic policymaker standpoint. I, I do think it's interesting to see the ways in which some of the larger non-G7 players have um, experimented with policy regulation over the course of the last decade. So I'm, I think I'm thinking about Brazil and sort of the data homing um, the effort that a few years back in which ever there was a, and I think R uh, Russia tried this recently as well, in which the idea was anybody operating within the um, Brazilian jurisdiction or later Russian jurisdiction would have to have a replica of all of the data that was passing through their servers domestically in order to operate. I, I believe that that was the case. Um, that is an interesting sort of effort uh, from a power play standpoint to say, you know, if you want to, if you want to operate in our market, we're going to start to impose some restrictions on you. And, and frankly, some, only some of the largest countries can get away with this. We see this with India too, in terms of looking at what is its market making power and how can it think about 
bringing some of tech to heal, but most countries don't have this capacity to do it. And so what I would be very interested in is looking at what are the sort of um, you know, economic cooperation opportunities, economic cooperation zones to be able to say, this is sort of going to be our approach relative to tech. And then how do we use that block power to really engage in the global policy conversation? Uh, because not every country is gonna have a billion person market. Not every country is gonna have a multi hundred million person market. And so you do see countries that are smaller are really excluded from the discourse around like, what are their priorities of regulation. You mentioned, you know, indigenous languages earlier. I mean, I think that the, the sort of market making forces of these large tech companies at scale is really around how do we extract the greatest value from the least degree of customization possible. Um, and, and I don't mean that necessarily, that is just a product incentive. It is not a moral right. incentive. It is not a values incentive. It is purely a product incentive. But when that exists, you end up with products that are developed, say, for like the majority, the largest country in, an, in a given sort of geographic linguistic zone. So you end up, end up with folks from Nepal and Sri Lanka and the like working off products that were primarily developed for an Indian market. And that creates sort of a homogeneity that really undermines the sort of national character um, and autonomy of countries in, in ways that can be, you know, I, I think not from my position sort of problematic relative to sort of our fundamental human and cultural rights. Great, and I, I see that I've gone over the time that I should start <laughs> taking questions from others. Um, and I'm gonna take one from my colleague, Charles Kenny first. Um, and this is something we actually talked about before we get we went online is that, you know, when, a lot of times when people talk about innovation, they're talking about the shiniest bauble of technology now available, but it seems like you're, you're interested in the kind of the foundational aspects um, that kind of inform our experiences with technology. And so what are some of the basics you think we should be focusing on and why, um, particularly, you know, your realm of promoting access to information, like what are the tools that we really should be focusing on and other countries should be focusing on providing citizens or investing in? Um, yeah, I, I would say connectivity and local services. Uh, so connectivity is the backbone of, of opportunity. Um, yes, there are certainly other challenges. We talked about this at the beginning, sort of extremism and, and um, polarization, but the, but from sort of an economic opportunity, educational opportunity, participation opportunity, um, access to access to services opportunity, it is all about connectivity. And I am I'm not a connectivity expert, so I'm not going to throw statistics at you. But we know that access to inexpensive, reliable broadband remains very much um, the the province of those who already live in wealthy countries and are living at the in the urban centers of those countries and lower middle income countries as well. But um, those urban centers are where connectivity is reliable and accessible. And much of the world continues to design for people who are online all the time. And that's simply not the case for, for many places in the world. So really thinking about use cases that are require partial connectivity, um, and then sort of the other piece of it, so think about use cases that require partial connectivity, investing in connectivity globally. Um, and then the other piece of it is this local language question. From, from everything that we have seen, local language content, local language services are a driver of a flourishing online ecosystem. We know it's called like over the top services and sort of the parlance, like over the top services that are localized and customized to the communities that they serve. So if you were to go on the web and try to search for something in your local community and it's not there, you are going to be disincentivized from using the web as a primary tool. So if you want to build a flourishing web ecosystem, you have to start with local services and local languages. There have been some broader efforts to do this. Google had a huge effort about sort of like digitizing, you know, the African continent, Google Africa, um, that was really focused on how do you bring sort of local uh, SMEs online so that people knew where they were and could have access to them. But it, it hasn't, it's not something that has been applied consistently. And it, I have not seen many countries put this forward as sort of a primary policy objective in their IT ministries or, or, or investments. And so that, that would be something that, that feels really important because once you have that sort of uh, critical mass of, of participation in these digital spaces, that then enables the sort of flourishing and creation of other, other forms of innovation and services that, that can be quite exciting. Great. And now I'm gonna take a question from my colleague, Ugoma Wonkwo, who, let me find it, I just lost it. Oh, yeah, it, I think this is something we spoke to, but we didn't actually dive in deep. And when it, we talked about the importance of public trust and the, the erosion of public trust in institutions, but 
what are the lessons that can be learned from how Wikimedia has developed its own credibility over time um, for rebuilding public trust in institutions? Uh -huh. I, I love that. Thank you, Uma. Um, so I, I think the thing that has always fascinated me is that Wikipedia didn't start out trusted. Um, there are many institutions that assume a degree of credibility by default or at inception. So a new government agency assumes we are the agency. We are sort of the chartered ones with the, with the public credibility. Uh, many institutions of the press assume a degree of credibility by simply being a matter of the press. Wikipedia started with this posture of we are so not trustworthy. Don't trust us. Check the citations, you know, do your research. You know, this is just a work in progress. Everything, you know, might be wrong or subject to change at any minute. And has very much continued with that. It's it, we recognize now that Wikipedia is largely trustworthy. Certainly, um, you know, from a statistical standpoint, probably as trustworthy as you know historic encyclopedias. But but we still come at it with this posture of saying it's a great place to start your research. Don't finish it. Check the citations. That's why they're there. Um, I, and I think that there are a few aspects to that. One is a, a transparency of intention to the users. Um, another is a transparency of the product to the users. You can check, as I said, the citations, but you can also go back and look at every edit that's ever been made to any Wikipedia article. Most people don't do that, but it is an incredible accountability enforcing function for the people who construct those Wikipedia articles and for us as an institution to maintain that commitment to our readers. And then a sort of another piece of it is we treat our readers as though they're smart and we actually expect them to be able to navigate ambiguity and be able to assign trust judgments to different articles. If I'm reading something about a pop star, for example, like Lizzo, I, I'm like, ah, oh, this is probably as accurate as I needed to be about Lizzo. But if I'm reading something about sort of a, you know, the US census, well, I'm going to perhaps assign a different degree of trust to that article. And I may go back and, and sort of, you know, get into the citations. And we don't prescribe, prescribe to our readership what that should be. We assume and understand that our readers will use Wikipedia in ways that are most functional to them. And so what does this all mean for sort of trust in institutions? I think that there needs to be an active process of going out and building trust and seeking understanding of what your users, your audience, your sort of target cohort actually is, where you see those trust gaps, there may be the requirement that you actually modify or change the way that you work. There was a time in which Wikipedia was not trustworthy. We went through a fairly public scandal about inaccuracies and hoaxes, and we modified and changed the behaviors and the policies in order to address and, and redress some of those challenges. Um, and then assume constant you know vigilance on this you can't sort of rest on your laurels and say you know we are the you know largest news publication national news publication and so therefore we will be trusted and always be trusted there must be a constant process of dialogue with your end users around what that trust looks like and be very transparent when you get things wrong so we maintain a list of about 100 different hoaxes it's pretty good for 55 million articles it's just about 100 right um but we're extremely transparent when when we get things wrong we actually publish you know blog posts, press releases, we're like, hey, there was a sock, pu sock puppet ring on Wikipedia that was made up of PR agencies. And like, this isn't acceptable. And it actually brought PR agencies to the table. But we were able to say, you know, you need to maybe apply a greater degree of, of, of vigilance on you know, these types of articles because of the ways in which Wikipedia might be manipulated and used. And so that real transparency and accountability back to, your, to you know, the, the folks that you're trying to reach feels like something many institutions are sort of constitutionally afraid of engaging with because it is hard. And you know you don't always have control over that narrative. Um, yeah, there's probably other things, but I'll leave it there. Yeah, and I'm seeing really excellent, needy questions come in, but we've got two minutes left, so I'm. Oh no. I'm not. <laughs> we'll save it for another conversation, hopefully. Um, but I, I, well, I'll close by thanking you for for taking the time. It's been a really interesting conversation. Um, the question I have for you: I, You're leaving. You're departing Wikimedia Foundation in April. Is it April? Yes. Or? In a month, yeah. You know what you're doing next, or <laughs> um, I, I'm I'm going to take a break. Uh, I was I was thinking a sort of three month break. Um, I, I don't have a hard and fast plan. I am probably going to um, relocate from San Francisco back to the East Coast. I am talking to a couple different organizations about 
different opportunities. Um, I, I am tempted, I don't know if you've written a book yet, Mike, but I'm tempted to write a book, but it also seems like a tremendous amount of pain, suffering, blood, sweat, and tears. And so uh, if I were, I'm, I'm very interested in this idea of like the right to knowledge. We talk a lot about the right to expression. We talk a lot about the, the right to expression is sort of a component of the information credibility, content integrity question. I'm very interested in what does it mean to really think about um, the, the rights of citizens to have not just access information, but to be represented in information, the rights to our cultural heritage, the rights to um, our identity, um, these, these sorts of, not just, you know, the, certainly there's sort of like an anti-corruption angle, a transparency angle, but what does it mean to really think about the right to know as a fundamental um, uh, complement to some of these other these other sort of rights that underpin a democratic society? Um, and I know that there are people who've been work, who've worked on that, but I've yet to sort of see that articulated in in sort of a single space. And, and, I, and certainly having spent all this time at Wikipedia, we see how valuable the access to knowledge, the participation in knowledge, the right to know is. And, and and, you know, we didn't speak about this, but the lengths to which people will go to participate in knowledge as one of those fundamental rights and the um, very real consequences that come of some of our community members have encountered as, as part of that, uh, you know, I, I think that there's something there, so. I'm sure there's something there. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that is a fascinating subject and a fascinating frame. I hope you write it. Um, I have not been <laughs> Charles Kenny's written about 30, so you can talk to him. I know, every every other year I turn around and Charles says a new book. I think it's two a year or something. Um, anyway, that will be fascinating. I hope you pursue it. Um, but thanks again for taking the time and really enjoyed the conversation. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me.